Coming up on today's episode of The Virtual Couch, we're going to tell the story of the elephant and the writer. The elephant is the emotional part of your brain, the writer, the logical part of your brain, and we're going to make sense of why at times that six-ton elephant just seems like it's running out of control, that your emotions are leading the way regardless of what you try to do as the writer. We're also going to talk about a visceral reaction. You're going to learn how miraculous it really is that the fact that our emotions do lead the way, and we're going to talk about some ways to just put yourself in a better spot to be able to control that giant elephant of emotions that's within each one of us. So that and plenty more coming up on today's episode of The Virtual Couch. Hey, everybody, this is a very quick advertisement, and I know I'm a podcast listener. You can hit the little fast forward button probably on your podcast player, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, but bear with me. I'll try to make this quick. As a therapist myself, I obviously recommend that everybody give therapy a try because when people ask me, do I need therapy? I don't even have to talk to you. The answer is yes, I need therapy. Everyone could use a sounding board. Everybody could use uh, an objective third party. Everybody could kind of dig deep a little bit and find out what are things that they've been holding back on? What are the things that they feel like they should be able to get over or shouldn't be worrying about? Shouldn't, shouldn't, nobody wants to be should on. But we're all hanging on to things that uh, would be helpful to process. And there's even things that we thought we'd achieve by now or things that we really want to achieve so that we won't have these regrets in life. And so if there are people listening right now that might be noticing that their anxiety or their depression might be getting a tiny bit worse, especially with what's going on in the world right now, let's get to it. Let's not leave that untreated. You owe it to yourself, to those around you, your spouse, your kids, you. I mean, you are the you owe it to you at the very least to give therapy a try. So if you're nervous about finding the right fit, if you're worried about bumping into somebody in the therapy waiting room, if you have any worries about therapy, might I recommend that you go immediately to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. Again, that's betterhelp.com forward slash virtual couch, all one word. And just take a look at the world of online therapy. Go check out what over half a million, approaching a million people have already done before you and sign up now by going to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch and get the help that you need, the help that you maybe didn't even know that you need. There's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network, which might not be available in many areas. And especially right now with shelter in place, with social distancing, betterhelp.com is designed to do video therapy, telephone therapy. They even have uh, appointments that you can text. So the service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account at any time and message your therapist and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus you can schedule these weekly video phone sessions, whatever it is. So you won't have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. Although every time I do this ad, I do want to say that my waiting room is quite lovely. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. Oftentimes you can start communicating in under 24 hours and the betterhelp.com assessment, the intake alone is brilliant. And they also work with with all kinds of things. Acceptance and commitment therapy, one of my favorite techniques. Emotionally focused therapy. They work with anxiety, with OCD, with depression. So do yourself a favor. Go to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. You'll receive 10% off your first month's services. And, and I can't lie, obviously, if you're going to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch, and this is the virtual couch podcast, it's going to help me out a little bit too. So go check it out. You'll receive 10% off your first month services. What are you waiting for? Just go check it out. Betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. Try it today. So 202, 202 of the virtual couch. I am your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, a certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father, four ultra marathon runner and creator of the path back an online pornography recovery program that is helping people reclaim their lives from the harmful effects of pornography. If you or anybody that you know is struggling with pornography, trying to put them behind them once and for all. And trust me, it can be done in a hold the shame strength based, become the person you always wanted to be then go to pathbackrecovery.com and there you will download a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to put pornography behind them once and for all. Again, that is pathbackrecovery.com. And please go to Tony's Experiment, T-O-N-Y-S-E-X-P-E-R-I-M-E-N-T.com. And there you will find Nate Bagley's Epic Wives Experiment. 
and I am signed up even though I am not an epic wife. But uh, I am very curious and, and, and excited to kind of see what this whole thing's about. There's only a few more days to sign up for that. But uh, if you didn't hear the episode that I did with Nate last Thursday, please go give it a listen. He is a, a relationship researcher, a very dynamic person, and this Epic Wives experiment is based on a phenomenal amount of data. It's a program that he has put together to uh, to really improve marriages. And don't worry, there's an Epic Husband's um, experiment coming up in the not too distant future. He talks about that on the podcast as well. And just run right over very quickly to tonyoverbay.com slash courses and download the free parenting program. Parenting, parenting positively, even in the not so positive of times that continues to be free, will always be free. And the feedback on that, I, I, I will gush and, and just, uh, be overwhelmed with the amount of positive feedback on that positive parenting course. So let's get to on go to Instagram at Virtual Couch and uh, Tony Overbay licensed marriage and family therapist on Facebook, all that good stuff. Sign up at TonyOverbay.com to find out more about upcoming programs. Yeah, all that good stuff. So let's get to today's topic. I feel like one of the questions that I get asked the most is talking about how do you control emotion when when your emotional brain kind of kicks in when the amygdala goes crazy, the fight, flight, or freeze part of your brain starts to just take control, what do you do? And I don't want to say, hey, at that point, it might be too late for right then, but I really want to talk about what we can do in those situations. I'm going to bring in a lot of resources today. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to tell the story of the elephant and the rider. If you've never heard that, this is a phenomenal story. And I'm also going to pull from The Body Keeps the Score. That is an amazing book that I have been meaning to do a podcast on for so long, but it is so much data and information that I'm just going to introduce that today in hopes of addressing this at a later date. So first, let me tell the story of the elephant and the rider. And I'm going to refer to an article from creativehuddle.co.uk. I found that this was, and if you Google the elephant and the rider analogy, you'll find a lot of sites that will talk about this. So the elephant and the rider from Creative Huddle, this article refers to psychologist Jonathan Haidt, who introduced this useful analogy for thinking about behavior change. So Haidt argues that we have two sides to us, an emotional side, which will be played by the elephant, and an analytical or rational side, which is played by the writer. So in Haidt's analogy, he shares that the writer is rational and therefore can see the path ahead, while underneath him is the elephant. And the elephant obviously provides the power for that journey. However, the elephant is irrational and it's driven by emotion and instinct. So maybe you can see where we're going here. So there, it's also referenced in the book uh, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, he refers to these as System 1 and System 2. And then in this article, they refer to a book called The Chimp Paradox by Steve, uh, Steve Peters, where he references this concept as well. But so, perched atop the elephant, the rider holds the reins and seems to be the leader. But the rider's control is precarious because the rider is so small relative to the elephant. So anytime the six-ton elephant and the rider disagree about which direction to go, the rider is going to lose. He's completely overmatched. So again, the article, I love the, this analogy because it says, using this analogy, it becomes very clear of why adopting new behaviors can be so hard. So we, we especially talk about this when we're changing behavior from an individual point of view, but it can also be applied to leading change in large organizations, groups, family dynamics, that sort of thing. So if the elephant is the emotional part of us and the elephant is truly the thing that is, is powering us, our emotions power us, and the rider is this rational part perched atop the elephant, the rider can often logically know that you know, it sees the path ahead, and it, and it says, uh, you know, "Elephant, I don't think that's a good good direction to go." But often, the elephant is already on its way; it's it's lumbering forward. And even worse with this analogy, what I find very true is that if the elephant gets spooked, if a, if a mouse runs in front of the elephant, that sort of thing, if the elephant gets distracted because he's hungry and he sees a peanut or whatever the elephants want to eat, I'm stuck on the Disney and Dumbo. I think he enjoyed peanuts. But you can see that the, the emotional part, the elephant is going to go in the direction he wants. And oftentimes the writer or the logical part of our brain is going to know that is not, we shouldn't be eating the peanut right now. 
We've got things to do, but the elephant is going to continue to move forward. So in, in this article on Creative Huddle, it says, what should we do to keep in control of the elephant? As the rational writer, we might know where we want to go, but we need to motivate the elephant by tapping into emotion. So finally, to improve the chances of the elephant staying on course, we need to shorten the distance to its goal, and we, we need to remove any of the obstacles. If you, take, if you think about this even in terms of, let's just talk about diet. In, in diet, we need to remove the obstacles. Uh, we need to get rid of all the candy in the cupboard. That is a very personal and truthful example in my house. Um, he has an analogy, and I'll put a link to this, but the rider, the elephant, and the path, a tale of behavioral change. That uh, there's an article there that um, on this that I'll post, and but if you go look on YouTube or again Google this, there are a lot of different uh, versions of this story, and people have put um, very creative things up on YouTube that show this as well. So I'm going to jump over to another article. This is one on Medium, uh, Medium.com. This is by Itamar Goldmeans, and this one is talking again about the same analogy, and it's titled "Advise the Writer." steer the elephant and shape the path. And so this one has a very, very nice graphic that shows from the book. We're going to talk about the writer. So the writer, the writer. So again, that's the logical part. Let's think of the logical part of your brain. The the writer, the writer loves to contemplate and analyze doing so with a negative bias, almost always focusing on problems rather than solutions. The writer is frustrated by uncertainty and easily exhausted. So um, it's Amar Goldmean. It, it Amar Goldmean says, the writer is a metaphor for the rational mind. So in your brain, typified by the free, the prefrontal cortex, this is the area of the brain that looks for patterns, it makes plans, it predicts the future, it monitors the self, and it attempts to distinguish between and suppress animal instincts. And I just want to say that one of the things that stood out to me when talking about the rational mind is um, looks for patterns, makes plans, predicts the future. So my favorite therapy Beautic modality of choice, acceptance, and commitment therapy so well explains that the brain has this need for patterns. And so by oftentimes we find ourselves ruminating about the past, trying to make sense of, of the past. Why did this happen? But I did this. And it wants to look forward to the future of saying, and what if this happens? And both of those things, bless our brain's heart, keeps us out of the present. So oftentimes we find ourselves just overwhelmed with emotion because we are so stuck in trying to figure out the past and trying to guess what will happen in the future. And also predicting the future, that is one of the surefire ways to feel anxiety because that's the brain saying, what if, what if, what if a lot of these things might happen? And as if you, if we learned anything about anxiety, we know that oftentimes, I don't know what a percentage would be, but maybe 99% of those things that we worry about aren't going to happen. And again, I love this concept of taking a look at this as if our brain really does think it's doing us a favor. And and when I had Dr. Mary Wild on a, a couple of months ago talking about anxiety, I love how she identified that a little bit of anxiety is is fine. It's great. A lot of, a little bit of anxiety will motivate us for change. It's it's that extra dose of anxiety that can often cause us to feel frozen or to feel stuck. So uh, in this, uh, again, um, Itamar Gold means in this advice, the writer steer the elephant and shape the path from medium.com. The second part that he talks about is the elephant. So the elephant, which again, we know is emotion. The elephant is easily spooked and hates doing things with no immediate benefit. Holy cow, I love that. Our emotional brains don't want to do things that don't have an immediate benefit. It is stubborn. It needs reassurance and it's quickly demoralized. That one just rings so true to me that if, if I am not an immediate success, I can often feel emotionally demoralized. But it is powerful, it is tireless, and it is difficult to actively direct. So he talks about, of course, the elephant is a metaphor for the emotional mind, typified by the amygdala, the root of fear and trigger of the body's stress response. Negative emotion has a narrowing effect on range of thought. Positive emotion allows the mind to wander creatively. I want to say that one again. Negative emotion has a narrowing effect on range of thought. When we find ourselves stuck in the negative, we typically go down a bit of a rabbit hole. We, we narrow our focus to feel like basically all roads lead to what is wrong with me? Nothing works. I'm stuck. Positive emotion allows the mind to wander creatively. What can that look like? This is where I love the concept of mindfulness. If we recognize that we are, are anxious or starting to freak out about something that we are unsure of, again, the brain, the rational mind, even trying to predict the future or make sense of things, 
the, the, the brain can kind of go, but what about this? What if, what if, you know, what if I get, uh, what if I get in a car wreck? You know, when I, when I, if I want to go down, I've got a client, they want to go to the ocean, you know, and they're saying, but what if I get in a car wreck? Uh, what if I don't know where to go? What if there's a accident? What if the traffic is really bad? And all of those things, if you look at this, have a, a narrowing effect on range of thought. It all leads back to, I'm not doing it. I'm not going anywhere. Positive emotion allows the mind to wander creatively. Positive mind, positive emotion is noting that these things are, yeah, maybe, maybe there will be um, an accident on the way down there. Maybe there will be traffic. Maybe my path will be diverted, but I'm going to just set that aside and stay positive and I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to start driving. And so that positive emotion allows the mind to wander creatively. It allows the mind to say, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with that. We'll figure it out. Uh, we've got GPS. We've got side roads. Um, we'll figure it out. And then finally, the third part he talks about in this article is the path. So even when the rider and the elephant cooperate, they must know what direction to head. Without a clear vision of destination, change will not happen. The elephant tends to follow the path of least resistance. I talk about this all the time. The brain knows what it knows. The brain wants the path of least resistance. In the acceptance and commitment therapy world, and I know I overuse this analogy or this example, but if you have ever sat in an audience and heard somebody talk about uh, something, anything, very motivating. I always go with the, someone talks about their amazing story of, you know, going from couch, uh, couch potato to marathon runner and talking about the wonderful experiences they've had. And if you're sitting there listening to that, you might get a little squirt of dopamine and you feel like, oh my gosh, I want to do this. Let's do it. I want to run a marathon. And then your brain immediately says, yeah, but uh, I don't know, you don't really know of any uh, marathons coming up or, you know, I've heard that that might be bad on my knees or, yeah, I really don't want to go do all that training by myself. Or, you know, the brain will come up with these reasons not to do the activity. The brain's trying to hook or fuse you to these stories, these stories of the what ifs, because why the brain wants path of least resistance and why I, I will talk about this every chance I get. The brain, bless its little pink squishy heart, the brain wants to live forever. I don't blame it. I mean, it, when you kind of start living by your values and figuring things out, um, there's a lot of cool stuff to do. So the brain says, all right, I want to live together, live, live forever. And it feels like if it is expending a lot of energy or electrical activity, that for some reason it has some finite supply and it will run out. So this is the part where we, if we look at patterns of behavior, if we pull when something becomes routine, when something becomes a habit or habitual, whether it's a thought or an action, the brain files that away in this little part called the basal ganglia, the habit center. And, and we note that the habit center, when, when actions are pulled out of the habit center, tying our shoes, backing out of the driveway, whatever that is, the brain uses very little electrical activity. When something becomes a habit, you don't even have to think about it. So the brain wants to just pull from the habit center. It wants to just, you know, file things away in this area of the brain that will require the least amount of electrical activity because it feels like that will allow it to live forever. But again, bless our brain's heart. It doesn't know that it all, it does not have a finite supply of electrical activity. The brain is uh, much more capable than it even thinks it is. So path of least resistance is basically just saying, I know what I know. And I'm afraid of the unknown. If you go and run that marathon, I don't know what's going to happen. You might end up uh, having a heart attack. You might get hit by a car. You might get devoured by a, a pack of wolves on some trail somewhere. So, you know, the, the elephant tends to follow the path of least resistance. The emotional part of the brain tends to follow the path of least resistance. So he talks about that being a metaphor for the environment. External stimuli make up the world that the mind consciously and unconsciously interprets and reacts to. So forces like convenience distraction, and cognitive biases play a significant role in directing the behavior. So he, he uh, this article, he talks about, the, so we got the rider, the elephant, and the path. These are guiding metaphors. So how, what do you have to do? He says he suggests a three-part strategy addressing the rider, the elephant, and the path. Let's first talk about the rider. Follow the bright spots. Investigate what's working and clone it. So if something's working, um, that's not a bad idea to try to stick with what's working. Uh, he talks about scripting the critical moves. Don't think big picture. Think in terms of specific behaviors. I had this conversation uh, yesterday, I believe it was, with a client. And this is the one where, and I, and I am a goal setter. I like goals. But I love that I had a client say, um, they said, you know, I, I am often told to set goals. I have not been a big goal setter. And, and to the point of where, if we go back to one of my favorite episodes, uh, I'm talking about psychological reactants. And if you haven't 
If you haven't heard of that term, please go look this one up. It was just a couple of months ago. But psychological reactance is that instantaneous negative reaction of being told what to do. So a lot of times if someone isn't a goal setter by nature and they constantly are being told, hey, you need to set goals, their brain's going, no, I don't. I don't have to do that. So they got this psychological reactance that's kind of built in. It's innate and within us. It's, it's our agency. It's our, it's our God given right or ability to not be dominated by an alpha male or a, a society that wants to do us, uh, no good. So even when we're telling ourselves, Hey, you need to set goals again, our brain's going to go, I don't have to do anything. So, so. It, I love how it says, script the critical moves. Don't think big picture. Think in terms of specific behaviors. Goal setting can be wonderful, but I'm more of a fan of living by a value. Here's an example of that, that I, I recently spoke with someone who said, I'm going to read X amount of books in the next calendar year. And I think that's a great goal. Um, I, if I'm going with audiobooks, I could meet, meet a goal like that. If we're talking reading books, uh, I don't know if I get through one or two because um, it's, you know, when I sit down to read, I fall asleep. If I listen to a book, I, I am all in. So, but but if the value if he, if he, if this person were to set a value if their if they their value is learning then if they live by their value they're going to read more books if they just simply say i'm going to read i don't know 30 books in a year and then they fall short of that number now all of a sudden we ba- we've introduced that what's wrong with me you know i can't even live up to my goals so that's the only thing that i find that can be a challenge when it comes to setting goals again goal setting is fine but if the result of setting the goal ends up with us saying What's wrong with me? I couldn't even keep the goal that I set. Then that's, you can see maybe where that starts to become difficult. But if you live by a value of learning or if you have a value of fitness, for example, and then, then you're going to set a goal of exercising daily instead, you know, then that's going to be one where I'm living by my value. There's going to be a lot more success there. So back to how to direct the writer. He says, point to the destination. Change is easier if you know where you're going and why it's worth it. Now, I, I love that, but this is again where, and this is why I want to do this episode today. I felt like there were so many areas I could just get off on a soapbox and talk about the things I'm passionate about. But pointing to the destination, this is kind of insinuating that we're at point A, point toward point Z and, and get moving. I'm fine with that, but just know that from A, there's going to be a B. And once you get to B, B might lead you to C and C might lead you to D. I often talk about when I left my software career after 10 years or so, I went back to school, I got my master's in counseling, and I always thought that this would be more of a part-time thing. I wanted to maybe write a book or two, have some letters behind my name and see a handful of clients. Little did I know it become a passion. 15 years later, this is everything that I want to do. Everything I want to do is, is about therapy and helping people and how to make people better husbands and fathers and wives and to be more dialed in with uh, their parenting, with their faith, with their careers, with their health, you know, learning to live by their values. I'm getting off on a tangent, but I, I met with someone. I will always remember this. I met with someone when I was contemplating career change and I knew this person did well financially. And I said, Hey, I would like to do well financially. And so I went to lunch with this person and they even said, you know, Tony, um, you would do fine helping me with what I do. You really would, but I just don't think this is your passion. And, and so I just remember thinking, wow, you know, this person is right. And so they were just kind of saying, you know what, stay the course. You'll figure this thing out. I was in grad school at the time. I was, I was doing a fair amount of writing. Um, I was working for myself. I, I had a young family and that, you know, that just led from one thing. So then I, I got my master's in counseling. That was A, got to point B. I didn't realize this is the, one of the dumbest things I can admit right now. I didn't realize I, that part of getting your master's in counseling is you had to do a practicum where you would actually see clients. I really thought I could just, uh, get the masters and, and then ha- again, have those letters and, and maybe use it someday. But so then all of a sudden I'm at point B where I'm starting to see clients. And then I think eh, that's kind of good. So then I think, all right, I might as well kind of do this part time while I'm, while I'm still running one of my, uh, one of my own companies. And then that led to, you know, uh, part of point C where now all of a sudden I'm seeing a handful of clients, which then led to point D where I started really appreciating the start of the, the clientele I saw, which led to point E where, you know, I was starting to work with people that struggled with pornography addiction or compulsive sexual behavior. And I learned that um, I could teach behavioral intervention all day, but that's where I, I just had this epiphany or just felt like, wow, this, you know, any, any of the addictions are more of a coping mechanism for you know, when, when somebody lacks in an area and that's where I felt like, Oh, wow, I want to help some of these, these men that I'm working with. Again, I could teach them how to, you know, be, they recognize a trigger, they have a thought and then try to put distance between thought and action, maybe drop down and do some push ups or run outside or call a friend to help from acting out. But in reality, why were they turning to this coping mechanism? And a lot of it was because they didn't feel dialed in with their parenting. So 
So I went and found the nurtured heart approach, or they didn't find it feel dialed in with their marriage. So let's go, let's go learn emotionally focused therapy or EFT, or they were struggling in their faith. Let's go learn Valor's stages of faith. Um, or their career. All right, let's pick up acceptance and commitment therapy and find out what their individual values are, not the values that they think that they're supposed to feel. So you can see that all of those areas start to just play into this. So point A led to B, B to C, C to D, and I don't know where I'm at now, G or H or I in life, but I am so happy to be here. Next, he talks about motivating the elephant. So, um, and again, the elephant is the emotions, right? The find the feeling. He says, knowing something isn't enough to cause change, Uh, make people feel something. And that is the thing that will often bring change is getting in your feelings. Feel the feelings. When we run away from our feelings, that is called experiential avoidance. That's the I'll do it later. I'll do it when I feel better. And if we are afraid to sit with our feelings, if we continually numb out our feelings to video games, food, pornography, gambling, alcohol, TV, our phones, then we're continually avoiding our feeling. And what we're doing is we're creating this this neuropathway in our brain that when we get the feels, when we feel uncomfortable, then instead of kind of sitting with it, breathing through it, and recognizing that this too shall pass, we're creating this pattern of behavior where when we feel, we turn to some sort of distraction. Um, he talks about shrinking the change, break down the change until it no longer spooks the elephant. Um, and, and in that one, I feel like in mindfulness, it's just kind of making room for the feelings, um, inviting the feelings to come along for the journey. You know, I've got things I've got to do. So I'm not going to try to say I shouldn't be thinking this or I shouldn't be feeling this. I'm going to feel it because I'm human, whatever that feeling or emotion is. But I'm going to try to diffuse from that thought or feeling and just get back to being present and, and doing something that that fits in with my my values. And he says, grow your people, cultivate a sense of identity and instill the growth mindset. And then finally, he talks about shaping the path, tweaking the environment. When the situation changes, the behavior changes. So change the situation. If you can change your environment, if you can put yourself in a different situation, then absolutely. When that situation changes, the behavior changes. One of the things that I have been chasing down for so long was very, very early on, I went to a training that talked about the idea of change. And it talked about the idea of running away from one's problems can be a bit of a pop psychology myth, simply meaning that if you, sure, if you run away from a problem and do nothing different, then yeah, yeah, I guess you are by definition running away from your problem. But they also talked about change can be for the better. You know, when you change your environment, you change your surroundings, you change the scenery. Now all of a sudden you have all kinds that you have, you know, in this, this particular article training, whatever it was that I cannot find talked about, you know, new city. Now you've got new jogging trails, you've got new sites, you've got new restaurants, you've got new churches, you've got new, um, new laundromats, you've got new people, which is going to, if you put yourself out there, cause a new environment, new change. And finally, uh, oh wait, no, he, he, two more. We're talking about shaping the path. He says, build habits. When a behavior ha- is habitual, it's free and doesn't tax the writer. Look for ways to encourage habits. So just like I was talking about how um, the basal ganglia, the habit center of the brain, that you can file away some things that aren't very productive in there. The goal is to build habits, positive habits, habits of routine, for example, habits of where every morning I feel like I got to get up and, and do a little bit of exercise. Or, you know, I, I come into the office and I want to write or I want to do my mindfulness. You know, I can't get in here without wanting to sit on the couch and do a little bit of meditation. And then finally, he says, rally the herd. Behavior is contagious. Help it spread. This is where I go back to the Marianne Williamson, uh, Marianne Williams poem, which is incredible. Let me pull that out and read that again right now. Whatever you're doing right now, just kind of sit back, maybe do a couple of uh, in through the nose, out through the mouth breaths. Just get yourself nice and present and, and sit back and listen to this poem. This is by Marianne Williams, and it says, Our deepest fear. Uh, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. And here's where it gets good. Uh, And it's Marianne Williamson. My apologies. I said Marianne Williams again. Um, But but your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. It's not just in some of us. It's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I love that poem. That is one I like to try to read to myself daily because, you know, share. That, that's where we want our people. We want our group. We want our tribe. And the way to do that is by putting yourself out there when you feel like you are living 
the life that you want to live by your values, chasing after your goals, and uh, and and you're the rider on this elephant. You're and you're able to have a little bit more control of that elephant if you're really setting yourself up for some sort of success. All right, I am going to try to wrap this up by reading a little bit out of The Body Keeps the Score. So here's another concept that I think is absolutely fascinating. So we're talking about, I remember reading, and The Body Keeps the Score is an amazing book about trauma. It's by Besser, Bessel van der Kolk, and I'll put links in here for this one, and I will do a very lengthy episode in the not-too-distant future on this. Um, I've been meaning to for, honest to goodness, about a year now. But so he talks about the viscera, the visceral sensations, the visceral reactions. And, uh, and, and if you're not familiar with the viscera, by definition, the viscera is the internal organs of the body, specifically those within the chest as the heart or lungs or the abdomen, as the liver, the pancreas, the intestines. Um, and here's where this comes into play. If you've ever heard of a visceral reaction, it's an instinctive gut deep bodily response to a stimulus or experience. So uh, without going too much in depth, um, the neurotransmitters or the, the chemical messengers in our brains determine what emotions we feel and, and force this physical response. That is a visceral reaction. So Dr. Vanderkalk says he's talking about um, the reptilian brain. And he says that taken together, the reptilian brain and the limbic system make up what he says I'll call the emotional brain throughout this book. And this is early on in The Body Keeps the Score. And obviously, we're talking about the emotional brain right now with the, uh, the, the elephant and the rider. So he says, the emotional brain is at the heart of the central nervous system, and its key task is to look out for your welfare. Let that one soak in a bit. The, the, key, the key task of your emotional brain, because it is at the heart of the central nervous system, is to look out for your welfare. And if it detects danger or a special opportunity, such as a promising partner, it alerts you by releasing, he says, a squirt of hormones. The, the resulting visceral sensation, rang, ranging from mild queasiness to the grip of panic in your chest, will interfere with whatever your mind is currently focused on and get you moving physically and mentally in a different direction. He says, even at their most subtle, these sensations have a huge influence on the small and large decisions we make throughout our lives, including what we choose to eat, where we like to sleep, and with whom, what music we prefer, whether we like to garden or sing in a choir, and whom we befriend and whom we detest. He says the emotional brain's cellular organization and biochemistry are simpler than those of the neocortex, which is our rational brain, a.k.a. the writer. He didn't say that. I am. And it assesses incoming information in a more global way. As a result, and this is where it just all makes so much sense, as a result, it jumps to conclusions. So this is talking about our emotional brain. It jumps to conclusions based on rough similarities. In contrast with the rational brain, which is organized to sort through a complex set of options. Here is the reason to make, well, you have the elephant and the writer. I love that story. But this is an example that just blew my mind. And I just, I try to talk about this as well whenever I can. He said the textbook example is leaping back in terror when you see a snake, only to realize that it's just a coiled rope. He said the emotional brain initiates pre-programmed escape plans like the fight or flight responses. And these muscular and physiological reactions are automatic. They're set in motion without any thought or planning on our part, leaving our conscious rational capacities to catch up later, often well after the threat is over. So how does that come into play? I think about this often. So there was a morning, if you listen well, way back in the day, where I literally did, it was actually on a Tuesday morning because I got a client coming in and that was, uh, he and or she was a part of this experience. But we opened the door, the person talked to me for a little while, and then I looked down and I uh, and there was a snake <laughs> in my office. To the point of where even when I came in this morning, I still, when I opened my door, I'm like, is, a snake? is there a snake around here? It was, it was wild, kind of terrifying, a very small snake. And then I had to put him in a cup and take him outside, um, he and or she. But Here's, here's where this uh, example goes into play. It talks about if I walk out the door and I see a rope coiled on the ground, I'm going to immediately react. That is that visceral response. That is that emotional brain. I'm going to react just trying to keep myself safe. You know, my, my brain, my body is trying to, to protect me. So it's, trying, it's, it's helping me recoil so that if it was a snake that was about to strike, I've got a little bit of a chance to get away from that. So if you really think about that, the miracle there is that 
our emotional brain is leading the way. It is working a few steps ahead of our rational brain or our logical brain. And again, what a miracle that I'm not even aware, but as my brain registers thing on ground, could be snake, could be dangerous, then I am going to react and then I'm going to go, oh, it's a rope. You know, on this one particular time I reacted and I'm like, it's a snake. I'm glad I reacted. It didn't strike or anything. I'll that make for a better story. But that is the essence of the emotional brain. The elephant is going to react before the rider gets a chance often. And what are some of the things that we can do? You know, we talked about um, trying to uh, you know, clear the path or make the path shorter, those sort of things. But know that there are going to be times where that emotional reaction is going to be there. And so when the rational part of your brain catches up, that that can be a time, and, and I think of this often where if, let's just say, my kid scares me or something, my emotional brain is going to lead the way. And then when my rational brain kicks in, that's the time to laugh. And, and that's one of the hardest things to do. I did an episode a while back on primary and secondary emotions. So, you know, oftentimes we react with fear or anger, but then that is masking this embarrassment that we were scared. So when we tap into that, that, that secondary emotion or the primary emotion, then that's where we want to have a laugh. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to have reacted. That's our brain. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And this can come into play so often, and I'll end with this, when I'm doing couples therapy and now just knowing that when somebody says something, especially when there's a lack of empathy there, or when somebody says, you know what, you just need to understand, here's what you do. Here's what you do to me. Here's here's how you make me feel. So our emotional brain is leading the way. When we are hearing this, here's what you need to know, here's what you need to, here's what you do. Our emotional brain is already leading the way. The elephant is already down the path, and the rider is saying, "Hang on, let's hear her out." You know what's she about to say? But the elephant's already—it's already heading down a path. So we need to learn to, when we can, when we recognize that that elephant is heading down a path, and the rider can get control of it, that we can that we do so, and that we can admit a mistake, or that we can admit that, oh my gosh, I was already starting to make assumptions, you know, let me sit back and let, let me kind of relax, be calm and let me hear you out. Let me hear what you have to say. Person who is, who is putting out this emotional bid or that sort of thing. Because you can see that too often when our emotional brain, the elephant, you know, the visceral reaction, when that leads the charge that already the, the game is rigged, you know, the, the communication pattern is compromised. So I hope that by learning this information today, that this will make sense. Be aware of the elephant. And some of our elephants are much larger than other elephants. Some of our elephants are very reactionary. And uh, and be aware that you are the rider, and that at times it's going to take a little bit extra time to con- you know to corral the elephant. And one of the best ways that you can do this, I mentioned, I you know, made reference to this earlier, but start training the brain with a daily mindfulness exercise. I know that you may hear that from all over the place. I was listening to a very popular podcast a few days ago, and and one of them was just asking to the other the, the host of the podcast, "Have you ever tried any of these mindfulness apps?" And he actually referred to Headspace, which is my favorite. And the guy said, "Yeah, I can't do it. I just can't clear my mind. I can't sit there and just, you know, empty my mind." And I just wanted to scream. I just I wanted to say that that's not the goal. You know, it, it's it's darn near impossible for us to empty our mind. What the goal of mindfulness is is that you are training your brain that when it is down this beaten path, when you are ruminating over something, when you are anxious about something, when you are overthinking something, that then when you turn to breathing, when you breathe in through your nose for three seconds and then out through your mouth for three seconds, all you're thinking about is the I am breathing in through my nose, I am breathing out through my mouth. So you're not clearing your brain, you're just not thinking about the things that were causing you to feel anxious or ruminating about things that caused you to feel anxious. So the practice of mindfulness is training the brain to be able to come right back to the present. We were, uh, we were at the beach recently and uh, I filmed a one minute just watching the oceans, the, or watching the oceans, watching the, the waves crash and, uh, and my wife and I just said, man, this is being present. And I filmed this because I was, I just thought, man, just being able to sit there and watch the waves. And, and I, I did it this morning. It was pretty cool. I, I missed the, the breeze and, you know, feeling the sand in my feet and the sun on my skin and, and that sort of thing. But just being able to focus on the waves that are crashing and hearing the sound of the waves, that's a mindfulness activity. Because when I'm, when I'm really focused on that, I'm not focused on the things that, that I'm worrying about or ruminating about. So start a daily mindfulness practice, whatever that looks like, whether it's an app, whether it's a YouTube video, whether it's you know just taking some time to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, whatever that is, I highly encourage you to just 
bring a little bit of awareness to that every day. Because after a few weeks, it starts to become a little more natural. And that's the part where when you start to recognize that the rider has no control over the elephant, a little bit of breathing, a little bit of getting yourself back present, and that elephant is going to slow the direction where it's headed, and you're going to be able to have a little bit more control over where that elephant's going. All right. Hey, uh, enjoy your time with the elephant and the rider, and I will see you next time on the Virtual Catch. Compressed emotions flying past, our heads and out the other end. The pressures of the daily grind is wonderful. Elastic waste and rubber ghost, I'm floating past the midnight hour. They push aside the things that matter.